Today on episode 25 of the Be A Marketer podcast, you'll meet an owner who believes that if you're not impressive, you're, by default, unimpressive. And I'm sharing why fine might not be enough to bring customers back. This is the Be A Marketer podcast. Be A Marketer. My name is Dave Charest, Director of Small Business Success at Constant Contact, and I've been helping small business owners like you make sense of online marketing for over 16 years. You can be a marketer, and I'm here to help. Well, hello, friend. If you know me at all, you know I'm pretty particular when it comes to food. Whenever my wife and I go out, we enjoy going places that offer, you know, unique selections, right? The last thing we need is another place with the same menu as every other place in town. And of course, we want the food and the experience to be worth the money that we're spending. And after the conversation you'll hear today, I really got to thinking about how we react when things are fine, meaning it wasn't bad, but it wasn't necessarily good either. As my wife and I like to say, you know, I'm not mad at it, right? But will we visit this place again? Probably not. And that's really the problem with fine. Whether it's food or any other shopping experience, fine isn't enough to make people return. There are just too many other options. And so that's the challenge. How can you create a product or service combined with an overall experience that's better than fine. Now, today, you're going to hear from someone who's a bit outspoken in this area. Remember from the beginning, if you're not impressive, you are by default unimpressive? Hmm. It makes you think, doesn't it? Well, friend, today's guest is Mike Bausch, co-founder and co-owner of Andalini's Worldwide Restaurant Group in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I first met Mike at the 2023 National Small Business Week Awards Ceremony hosted by the Small Business Administration in Washington, D.C. Mike was honored as the Small Business Person of the Year for Oklahoma. I was there on behalf of Constant Contact, showing support for the handful of customers who were also receiving awards for their respective states. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the awards, the Small Business Administration evaluates nominees from every state and chooses one winner from each based on the following criteria. Staying power, growth in number of employees, increase in sales, net profit, and net worth for the three prior calendar years, response to adversity, and contributions to community-oriented projects. Mike and the other 2023 recipients represent some of our country's best small businesses. Overall, it was a great experience getting to know many of the owners. And we even got to spend some time in the Rose Garden at the White House. That's when Mike was able to shake hands with the president. And he ended up on the POTUS Insta feed as well. I'll put a link to that in the show notes for you. Now, I was fortunate to have been seated next to Mike at the luncheon. And I enjoyed our conversation so much that I knew I had to talk with him again. Luckily for you and me, Mike agreed to talk with me for this podcast and a panel discussion with another award-winning Constant Contact customer. I recommend watching that discussion as well if you can. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Now, here's what I love about Mike. His approach to creating impressive dining experiences and to creating the systems to make sure that they happen again and again. Of course, it didn't start that way. So let's get to it. I asked Mike, what's it like owning a restaurant? Let's pick up the conversation there. It's not easy. It's not obvious, but we had that very, I don't want to go as far as to say cocky, but confident approach at the beginning. And I had worked in restaurants. I wasn't a complete noob, but at 22 opening a restaurant is not something I would advise anyone else to. I think my brother just thought it would be fun. I needed something different in my life. And I think taking a back door has always been my approach to life. If it seems like the obvious answer, I didn't like it. I wanted to do something that might be harder, and but it would be on my terms. And to do that at 22, I thought if it fails, I'm in my 20s. But I also didn't drive halfway across America to suck at making pizza. That was another thing I said very fervently. 
I'm curious when you started the business, then I knew you're mentioning the multiple brands that you have today. Did you open, was it just one restaurant? Like what was that progression? Yeah. Oh yeah. So my brother's vice president of Malibu rent a car. I'm graduating college and I go to law school for not even a day. I go there after doing the LSATs, after passing everything, after applying, after getting accepted, I went there and I said, I don't know, this is not for me. It just didn't feel warm. It felt, it wasn't the class or anything that was daunting. I just immediately felt like I was not in the room I was supposed to be in. There was nothing condescending about it. It just did not feel right. Anyway, so Jim gets transferred to Tulsa, Oklahoma from Fort Lauderdale. They moved their base of operations here. At that same time in 2004, Verizon Wireless, Alamo Rent-A-Car, National Rent-A-Car, Honeywell, just uh, Capital One, loads of businesses all moved into this suburb of Tulsa, truly a, a northern suburb of Tulsa. And my brother said, hey, if you wanted to do a family business, come on out, we'll figure something else out. And when I came here, I, I had worked a few pizza places, my brother had as well, nothing culinarily astounding, but there was not any local pizza place in this suburb that had 10,000 people to send on it. So that seemed like the biggest layup in terms of what could we create? We opened with a decent pizza, nothing to write home about. And I was dedicated to making it something you would write home about, something that could survive in the heart of New York, not just a suburb of Tulsa. And I had that mentality on the first day. It's a big thing I tell other entrepreneurs is that talent and knowledge are extremely, extremely overrated. Drive and a figure it out mentality will get you much further. Even with servers, even a bartender, a lot of bartenders all have that of like, well, I know all this about wine. And I'll say, I'll take the 21 year old kid who's super stoked about one wine over your knowledge of a hundred and your apathetic attitude. I guess one, why pizza? And then, yeah, where do you go on this journey to, I guess, learn the ins and outs, right? Pizza was the most approachable thing again. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. If I'm thinking purely mono, like people will say, oh, did you always love pizza? I'm like, yeah, I had a soul. It's not a high bar. <laughs> I conversationally say when someone says, oh, I don't like pizza. And I'll, I'll say, you're human trash. You should <laughs> roll yourself up in a carpet like the trash sushi you are because it's just a stupid statement. I don't like cheese and bread. That's it's incredible or any variation of it because anything could be a pizza. So, and we thought, what can this suburb of Tulsa handle? It was, you know, we thought German beer hall, that's not going to fly. Getting a liquor license in this suburb was hard back then. There was only so many given out. It was, what's the easiest thing to open at first? We're creating a restaurant that I thought was going to become a top 10 pizzeria in America. It was not like, okay, this will be obviously what happens. At first, our thoughts were, we're going to open up six of these in a year and a half. We didn't open up our second store till six years in. And in fairness, it should not have been a day before that. If it was, we would not have been what we needed to be. Those six years were just purely me getting my ass handed to me in a good way, giving up all of my 20s to this business that now I could speak on how to open not just pizzerias or restaurants, but just any business, knowing really what makes a connection to the customer, how to market, how to train staff, what is the way that something will resonate with an employee and a customer, as opposed to what will just be non or regular cliche, superfluous, another product. There's a lot here. So I want to go to a couple of places. I guess one, yeah, like tell me a little bit about, so you started in, it's 2005, right? Is when this business kind of gets off the ground? Officially open January 8th, 2005. So a couple of things that I'm hearing that are interesting to me. One is you said you opened with a pizza that was good enough to open with, right? Which I think is, tell me a little bit about that because I think that's an interesting concept where oftentimes people will, oh, it's not ready yet. It's not ready yet. But to your point of like having passion and going and moving and doing, right? Like you got it to a point where it's, I'm assuming well enough to open with and go with, but then you're going back in there and changing it, fixing it and making it better, right? So tell me a little bit about that. I really appreciate that people are starting to lean into the, hey, stop trying to make things perfect. That's become acceptable because a lot of times people are like, listen, you just went open and did this. I'm like, yeah, I did. I went up and then did this, but you didn't understand all of it. No, I didn't. And I wouldn't have. There's no book you can read. In fairness, we created a dough recipe that we were testing out in a home kitchen 
and it was good. And then when we went to the commercial level, when we did it in a Hobart, a big ass, you know, 40 quart mixer, it was completely different. It wasn't working. So I had to change it again. And that didn't even matter because our rudimentary knowledge of fermentation was so back ass words to what it is now and just knowledge of what it of what we were doing. But cheese on bread was going to sell in Owasso. In fairness, Owasso being the suburb of Tulsa, if I opened poop on a stick in Owasso, <laughs> it would have done at least two months of business. There's not a high bar in a suburb to get everyone to try it once. It was okay. And our dough was fine. The cheese was fine. Also, in fairness, fine is my F word. I say, I learned that over time that especially in a restaurant, if you sell lock nuts and you're the only place that sells lock nuts in town, you could be fine. You could have a perfectly fine person who serves it at the cash register. But in a restaurant with so many choices, fine is death. Because if it's just okay or amazing, those are the differences. If it was, oh my God, we have to go back. Now you get a return sale. If it was, it was fine. You want to go back next weekend? No, we're good. Let's try this other place. Or it was horrible. I'm never going back there. In both the fine, it was horrible, is zero. They're the same. And that was a realization that took me around four years when I realized, oh, if we just exist, that's not good enough. If we're fine enough, like the server brought the food out, that's not good enough. Because the dumb things we did were a dough recipe that was perfectly fine. We tried to sell everything that we could. So the menu was like 150 items. Stupidly, we thought the more we sell, the more we'll make. And that's not the case. It had to become all killer, no filler for people to go there. It resonate. And then they say, oh, I need to come back. Originally, we thought the more items, the more, oh, well, I need to try this next time. Well, if it sucked the first time, or again, was just fine, they're not coming back. So these were the hard lessons. Tell me a little bit more then, because I'm curious. I mean, there's a couple of things going on here. One, you've got to learn about the craft of the food, right? Creating yes. food that people want. That is amazing. And then two, you've also got to learn about the business aspect. And so I want to explore one, I guess, I mean, where did you go? Where you go to find this stuff out, both on the restaurant side and just the business side? Like, where are you going for this information? The biggest epiphany that occurred for me and us was a guy named Tony Gemignani, who anyone can look up right now, Google Tony Gemignani, G-E-M-I-G-N-A-N-I, -I, and you'll see a guy who is undoubtedly the Michael Jordan of pizza. And I'm very stoked that we're, he went from being this guy that everyone in the industry idolizes, and still that's the situation today, but he's my best friend in pizza at this point. We talk very often in the industry, and he had a team called the World Pizza Champions, he still does, and he was taking a college level course in pizza in Italy, which they've had for many years. He went and took it with Italian translators and had the idea to take it back to America. And I read about it in a trade magazine that he was taking it back to America and inviting, you know, people that had been in the industry for like 20 years to come to it. I asked, Hey, is that a real thing? Are you really doing that? Can I come to that? And he's like, well, if you can make it out to California on these days, yeah, you can. And I did. And I was the youngest person in the class. And learned from all these other guys, but I was doing some stuff that they weren't doing and that I was stretching fresh mozzarella, but my whole approach to dough was completely wrong. So humbling myself to say, hey, I definitely don't know, and you guys definitely do. I was in a class with people who were learning from him and learning from the Italians who brought Italian translators to teach this first American course. And I was in that first class and I was calling the first, after the first day, like, change this, do that, fix this, don't do that. And editing on the fly, I come back and our dough is way better. And I got invited to be on this team that competes internationally with Tony. And now today I am the president of that team of the World Pizza Champions. And we have become a 501c3. We have 50 members of the best pizza makers in the world on our team. That is a cohesive unit of pizza makers. And I'm really proud that of what we've done with it. But my secret sauce I'm good at creating a system. I'm good at seeing what's good and doing more of it. I'm also very natural at wanting to make something better, which lends itself to leadership. I'm not self-proclaimed like I'm a great leader, but I am good at saying, okay, hey, we need to do this. And that helped a lot. So having that experience in food and then learning from all these other people who are saying, hey, when you get home, contact the press that you did this event or that you came and did this thing. I'm like, really? Well, he's like, 
because I didn't know how news worked. I didn't know how marketing worked. And I thought, oh, I called the news station. They were smart enough to tell me, you call the news station, you're going to get an ad or sales rep who's going to want you to buy a commercial. If you contact a producer about what just happened, then you might get a news story on it. And that news story will matter to your public and it'll be free and it'll come off as unsolicited advertisement. So I was getting an education, not just in pizza, but in guerrilla marketing from the people who had been doing it for 20 years. Okay, so a couple of things here, and we're going to explore. I definitely want to go down the path of exploring some systems because that's one of the things when we were able to talk last time that I really picked up on. Like, oh, okay, you're really good at putting this together and creating something so you can replicate it, right? And train somebody on it and do all of that, which I think is amazing. Before we get there, I guess the first question is this I mean, did you have any doubts about just getting into this business at all when you were starting? I definitely, I mean, I thought to myself, okay, what's going for me? What's going against me? What's going for us is this is a small suburb that doesn't have pizza and I have nothing but time. And I believed if I gave everything I had to it, it would work because the thing that would make me feel better when I got anxious or was like, is this going to work out? Are we going to fail? Is this all going to fall in on itself? I would say to myself, well, these other dummies figured it out. (laughs) Why not you? When I said that statement to myself, I was like, okay, then yeah, these other dummies got it. You could figure it out. And that that made me feel better. I also was coming off of going to Officer Canada School of the Marine Corps. So my dad is a lieutenant colonel in the Marine. My brother had been in the Marines. My nephew's done two tours. And I had gone to Officer Canada School like my dad and was planning on being a JAG lawyer, but I have type 1 juvenile diabetes. So my Marine Corps journey ended after my visit to Quantico. But... I really saw how far I could push my body, not even knowing I had type one juvenile diabetes. I was 135 pounds of nothing coming out of it, not knowing why I was losing weight while other people were, you know, they're getting leaner, but they're not losing muscle. I'm losing muscle in in there. And then I thought, well, if I could do that and run on, you know, near no sleep and physically get up and run with no muscle in my body, then when people are like, how are you going to make the dough every day at, you know, 6 a.m.? I was like... Yeah, I got that. That part's not the problem. So the follow through and ability to adapt, I didn't have fear of. I just knew I had to connect the dots. So oftentimes people get stuck in the thing that they're doing. And what I've been hearing from you is really this idea of, you know, making adjustments and changes and you talk through, you know, the menu, right? Learning that that you had to take things off the menu, right? It's not about adding more. It's about doing, like, I guess, a small amount of things. If I've learned anything from watching people on TV, right? (laughs) Right? Like, it's like making it a small and doing that thing really awesome. And then, you know, you talked about learning about the PR thing. Like, what are some of the other things that, I mean, if you go back to that, just that first year of getting this off the ground too, like, what are the other things that you really learned in there that you take with you now? The things I especially teach and tell other entrepreneurs, other because I do talk to a lot, I've, a lot of pizza people, a lot of restaurant people about how to avoid 10 years of screw ups, like by doing my system. The thing I had to learn from experience, but I wish I could have said day one was if you're not impressive by default, you're unimpressive. You know, if it's not the fine theory, if you're not impressive by default, you're unimpressive. And that's a hard pill to swallow because you'll think we delivered the waters and the soda, the pizza came out on time. What's wrong? Why are we not doing better? It's a beautiful restaurant. That thing, that mentality is counterproductive. I also noticed whenever I start talking to someone about their restaurant, if the first thing they say is people love us and this is great and this is great, I know they're screwed. (laughs) I know it's not going to work because you have to lean into what doesn't work. You have to say, yeah, I don't like how our social looks right now. I'm not loving this, but I do think we could get there with this. Then you have the ability to grow. It's when people are like, the customer's the problem. We're perfect. There's nothing that can be done. There's nothing. It's You've said, I'm not seeking to advance. I'm seeking for others to adapt to me. Mm, interesting. I'm wondering, you know, it's funny on that, that whole fine thing, you know, so my wife and I, we obviously love to go out to eat. I'm pretty particular about food and that type of thing. And so to your fine comment, like when something's like just meh, I'm like, you know, I'm not mad at it, <laughs> right? I'm like, I'll eat it, but I'm not like, exactly. hey, let's go tell everybody about it kind of thing to your point. And your case in point, like that's what I say about the husband and wife that come out are going to walk into that car and they're going to crap on you. They're going to say everything that sucked. They're going to say it in the car. And 
the classic Chili's restaurant example would be to walk by your table and say, so uh, how's everything working and out, out tonight? <laughs> everything great? And then what they do is it's called a table touch. They'll table touch for the camera to prove to the boss interesting that they had a customer interaction. Now, the goal is not to fix you or make you love the place. The goal is to touch a table. So the problem with that is they're not going to fix you. If they go by everything great, you're going to say, I don't want to interact. You obviously don't want to interact. <laughs> so let's move on and I'll say it's great. So I train my staff to do what's called a customer connect. And I said, you, the goal is to get their poop, find out what they're about to poop on you <laughs> about when they get in the car and find it out at the table and fix it. So you have to start by a conversation. Hey, so great that you guys can come out tonight. Um, is this your first time coming to this restaurant? And then. Oh, great. Hey, look at that hat. I like that hat. I used to have a hat just like that. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Look at that watch. What sports team? Pretty much 90 seconds of rapport building. And at that point, then say, well, I'm Mike. I really appreciate you coming out. Hey, is there anything at all we can do better? No, no, it's fine. It's great. It's really, seriously, I want you to tell me, even if like the soda wasn't soda eat enough, just tell me anything. I'm like, well, you know, I was in the bathroom. There's a lot of trash on there. Wow. I really appreciate you telling me about it. Get them a free dessert. Thank you so much. Here's my card. Integration. Dave, it was so nice to meet you. Get the name of everyone. Now, that person really has nothing that they could go and crap on you about in the car. So, and if you gave them something to have them come back a second time, the likelihood of a return visit is significantly higher. And you built rapport, hopefully authentically. And now that's how we get to the find being, wow, that guy was good. He really, Mike guy, and now they're doing a review. Mike stopped by the table. It was cool. So now that's how we break from fine to impressive. Yeah, I love that. You know, I always talk about this idea of wherever you're having those interactions, right? It's like, how do you create just the, we call it like a wow experience, right? Just something that's just a great experience. It doesn't even have to be anything major, just something that's different that makes somebody say like, pay attention to it really. And just being able to do that. So I love hearing that. So I want to know, Mike, like, when you think about where you are now, what would you say is the biggest accomplishment you've had with the business so far? Oh, man. I mean, there's actual awards. There's been, you know, intrinsic or outside external verification of it being, I mean, the small business person of the year, meeting the president all of a month ago. We had a Guinness World Record in January for the world's largest pizza party that we tripled the world record that Pizza Hut failed at. <laughs> I hope Pizza Hut is hearing that because Pizza Hut loaded the deck with their marketing of making the biggest pizza and we got no press cycle off that. But we made the largest pizza party. They failed at a thousand. I don't usually like rub businesses <laughs> face in it, but I'm totally cool with rubbing Pizza Hut's face in that they couldn't get a thousand and we got 3,300 for the world's largest pizza party. But then having 300 staff members who genuinely seem like they dig their job, the amount that we've donated that we don't advantageously talk about, the real stuff that we've able. And at this point that I can open up pretty much anything in Tulsa. And it, it's like a Tarantino movie where people have no idea what it's about. That like, it's, it's Tarantino. I'm going to go see it. That value is great. And then it's really nice at parties where you meet people and they're like, there's just the normal, like, oh, what do you do? Huh? And then I say what I do. And it's like, I just advance the conversation around a half hour. It's just immediately like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I like you. Okay. I thought this was going to be a crappy party, but you see, okay, great. We can talk. That's nice. It makes life easier. So, I mean, taking all that in, right? Like, I mean, you, I think you mentioned, right? You're like a, a $15 million business now, right? Like, yeah. How does that make you feel? Like the back door paid off. Like, and the money side of it, if I had done a Wall Street job, if I had done what a lot of my friends from high school did, I could probably be making even more. But knowing that I have fulfilled, I think, my life's potential and that I'm still on that path is very, very fulfilling. And that's a great thing. And I think only by owning your own business and pursuing it in an entrepreneurial way is how you get there at least in the American society. If you're an entrepreneurship, doesn't mean you're owning businesses, but if you're really doing your art or your music or just doing your thing on your terms, mine is leading people and creating systems, which lends itself very well to a restaurant. So that is the win that I could say to myself back then that I did not know would happen at any point. The hope was, okay, we'll be able to live. We'll be able to survive off this which the first five years did not feel like it was very possible. 
truth be told, with one restaurant in a suburb, it did not feel like, okay, I'm going to be able to live off this. It was definitely a mad dash. Like, we got to open restaurants. We got to get tight on these systems. I want to be able to have a family one day. I got to create systems that are listened to and respected for that to occur. And the fact that that's my reality today is very, very cool. So I want to get us to the systems thing, and I'm going to kind of take a hop, skip, and a jump to get there. When we spoke before, we talked about some of the challenges that came through, particularly out of COVID, particularly for restaurants and all of that. And I think one of the things that, you know, like, look, I'm going to cut it short, right? Like, look, you've made it through that thing. You had to make some challenges. You had to do some things. You had to overcome some things and you got there. But one of the things that we got to was like, what are your challenges now? And you mentioned something about like the DoorDash algorithm and how you your makeup changed, right? You were doing like 15% takeout before, and now you're like 50%, right? And so one of the things that came out of that challenge was also how do you like retrain staff like to do those things as people are now coming back to the restaurants? And so, and you had said like, you know, who are we as a brand and how do we not lose that? And so I, I, I'm hoping you could tell me a little bit about why brand is so important, how you think about that and how you approach it. But then get us into those like, yeah, how do you set up a system to make sure that you can train that and and have that go through everyone? So in terms of knowing what your brand is, you know, some people stop and say, okay, because it's being used so much that they'll say, okay, the brand's the logo. The best way to describe a brand, as I've heard it, this is not my invention, but someone said, if Nike was to make a hotel right now, you could immediately imagine what that hotel would look like. If Hyatt Regency was to make a shoe, you have no idea what that would look like (laughs) because Hyatt Regency is not a brand. It's a company that has hotels, but you're not like the brand of Hyatt. It's just, it's a bed. It's not a brand. It's not a voice. It's not a personality. It's not an ethos. It's just a thing. So when you're coming up with a brand, revising brand standards right now, and nailing down exactly, hey, when this pizza is presented, there's two people that come to a table and one of them's holding an oil, an olive oil cruet that sends it off. And this is the feeling, this is the perfect experience and walk it backwards and say, what in that perfect experience is a non-negotiable? And then how do we train for it to occur? And I think people get really apprehensive and afraid when it comes to ensuring something occurs And the easiest way to identify how something is going to systematically occur is to look at it as an investment. The lazy answer is, well, they should know, or it's obvious, and it's not the case. All the great American hospitality brands, typically your Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Four Seasons, have three weeks minimum training with ongoing training. And your regular mom and pop pizza place has two Two days, most restaurants that are independent struggle for three days, and then it's typically not formulaic. It's training is three aspects to training. There's book training, whether or not it's a video or a PDF or whatever, it's book. And then there's one-to-one training. One person does it. The other person is there next to them. And the last but not least is on the job, just doing it over and over again. Most American institutions in general lean on on on-the-job training without book, without one-to-one. And by leaning into all three simultaneously, when I was really in a bad spot of how am I going to get this done, I just looked back to the Marine Corps. How did they do that? How? And it wasn't just the yelling. It helps, but it wasn't. (laughs) I was like, how do I do that without yelling? How to clean your weapon? Okay, sit down. Here, we're going to perform it. Watch you do it. Nope, that was wrong. Do this again. Okay, we're going to do it again. Now, let me watch you do it. Yep, you know how to do that correctly. You are properly trained to clean your weapon. And I thought, if we could do that for everything, for scripting at the table, for one-to-one experiences, role play, all that, and not be afraid of it, but lean into it, then we could stand out from the pack. And another, again, a confident statement when I would hear, People say, well, I can't, how do you make so many things from scratch? I mean, I can't trust these kids to even open the door at 11. I said it once and it just came to me and I say it all the time now. We trusted 17 year olds to defeat the Nazis. I'm pretty sure they could case sausage. (laughs) All right. So how do you get to the point where you, I'm assuming you have to articulate this vision, right? Like what is this experience going to be like for the customer? So I guess, how did you get to what you wanted it to be? And then, and then what is it? Is it? Is it writing it down? Is it make and then training it? Like, what's that process? It was easy when it was one to two stores. 
It was easy with one store because I'll do it and show you every time. Then at two stores, okay, I could bounce from store to store. Three stores, now it starts to get hard. Then it became, I we have to film all this and create a way where they can watch the video, not look at it like it's some corporate gobbledygook and buy in on it and test it to verify it. So videos, which in 2014, very expensive, hard notion to video record. Now, it's so stupid easy that when I see any business isn't leaning into videos, be it screen record videos or just selfie videos. In fact, I had the inverse problem last year that I had to take all of our videos and redo them because they were too good and they were too uh, professional. They were like nine minutes long for an introductory. I'm like, I got to make this a TikTok and essentially like, hey, okay, you're, this is what you're going to do. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. You're going to do this and, and shorten it from how to make this pizza in a nine minute video to like a one minute. Cause I was looking at TikToks and Instagram reels. And I was like, I just learned how to just cook the perfect porterhouse in 40 seconds by that video. Why can't we pull that off? And the attention span being shorter, but also cut down on training time. So systematically create videos and not just manage by what went wrong by, but manage by systems that it has to go right. So how do you ensure they do it every single time? has to be checkoffs and verification that you can't move on until X has occurred. And by that verification, by that systemization, which is just, now you're not managing the person. Now you're not managing anything other than the system. Manage the managers, verify, verify the verification. That's when real growth and real progress start to occur. And then it's just duplication of what works and editing what doesn't. So it sounds like, you know, you've mentioned a few times, like the systems is what you're good at. Did you learn that? Or is that just something that you inherently had? I think that's an inherent minor OCD level thing. Sure. Yeah. And I would get into how do I do this in a way where I could just have mental stability to know what's getting done. I was 18 working at a restaurant. This is my first system I made. I didn't even realize I was making a system at the time, but we would have, it was a steak restaurant, a very popular steak restaurant in the East Bay of San Francisco. And we would have to, the servers would put the baked potato on the, however, for each order, the baked potato. Well, the problem was servers will come up and have to count. There might be a ticket that was 20 steaks long and they'd have to count how many baked potatoes this one and then go get the baked potato and put it on there because that was the server's responsibility. I just started going and writing the number at the top so that the server could walk by and count them up and, and put them on to save 30 seconds. I was like, there's coming up and in my way, counting this off. There's a, there's a way around this, count it off and put it at the top of the ticket. It was just a simple thing. And then I was like the golden boy of the restaurant. Like, wow, is that the guy that came up with the number on the ticket thing? <laughs> That's a good idea. And you know, it was just stuff like that, that I started saying, what else can I do like that? Yeah. It's amazing how so many times the most impactful thing is something so simple, right? <laughs> exactly. So I want to shift us here a little bit. Well, I want to talk about marketing. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about, because this also seems to me, just having talked to you a few times, that this is also something that comes a little bit natural to you, right? And so I guess what's your relationship with marketing and, and just what's your approach? The number one headline of marketing is connecting to the selfishness of an individual. I could say in a less negative way, but connecting to the individual but people assume connecting with talking about themselves, connecting to them and what the value is to them is how you have value proposition. If you are entertaining or informing, that's great, but it has to be to the end user's benefit. And when you do that, again, an endearing story about your restaurant can be entertaining to that person that could bring them value. But when you go about it as we really need you to help us reach our goal. There's no buy-in from the customer. Knowing the packaging of that and leaning into packaging too. My brother would mock me a lot as a kid. Like, why do you love Lunchables? When Lunchables came out like in 91, <laughs> my mom would be like, we're going to buy deli meats that they sliced in the deli. That's real meat, not this garbage. And I'm like, but it's a yellow box and it's perfect. And <laughs> as an adult, I was like, why did I love that so much? I'm like, well, it's really, really tight packaging that made you feel cool at lunchtime. The same thing occurs now with leaving the Apple store with a crisp white bag and your MacBook Pro in it, as opposed to going from the used computer store and walking out with just a MacBook in your hand and no box. Why does one feel like Bush League and one feel pristine? 
If you can have the customer feel that level of purchase pride, then it's not about money. It's a lot easier to give the most expensive, most pristine pizza, especially in the pizza world, because it's a commodity. It's commoditized and people and everyone's fighting for the middle or fighting for the bottom. You're not going to win that fight. It's a lot easier to win the fight for the best. But at the same time, once you are going for the best, no one says, hey, you know what? Let's go to the second best pizza place in town. It's either the most convenient or the best. So you're not going to win most convenient. You're not going to win most affordable. So you got to go for the best. And in anything you do, that then leads into, okay, how do I make it the best? How do I create the greatest product possible? Not the most revenue possible, the greatest product possible, which will in turn lead to the most revenue, which will then lead to the most profit. And having that as an MO means, okay, now how do I convey that? We did all this. Now, how do I have Joe Blow consumer believe it and that it matters to them and makes their world better and say, even into the email world, I'm big on, I'll get emails or we'll create an email and I'm editing it. I'm like, you need to bold and capitalize the word you here. It's like, well, that's not grammatically correct. I'm like, I don't give a crap. It's not about grammatically correct. It's about pop. It's about me reading this extremely quickly and saying, oh yeah, I'm going to read that because it has, it's talking about me subconsciously. It'll always work better that way. Those are little things that I started to see the gamification of, of the customer. I enjoyed it. I truly did. So, but it also, I was like, wow, if I'm going to spend all this time on whatever marketing, let's have it and all this work and all this story now to convey the story and have it resonate is part of the magic sauce as well. And if you don't do that, it's all for naught. So it became extremely important. So it's really interesting, right? Because like a lot of this like marketing stuff is somewhat counterintuitive, right? In the sense that like to what your point about leading with the selfishness of like the consumer and the individual. And so it's really all about them where what you're trying to do is sell your thing. And I think the natural instinct, particularly if you're not there yet, like you don't get that, the instinct is to be talking about yourself and being so like, it's all me, 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 right? When it, to your point, it should really about you, 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 right? And so I'm curious as to Now, like, look, like, I think you're at this probably envious position, right? You've got, you know, you're a constant contact customer. You've got 90,000 contacts, right? Like, how do you start applying this idea of the selfishness of whatever and use that to get you to this place where you're, one, growing that list, but then also using that to tell us what it's like for you just in terms of driving business for you? I mean, having a big ass email list makes it a lot easier to drive business. You know, it's the snowball effect of now I have this, so it leads to more and the system is there. So even just the email acquisition is there. And now it's also a lot easier because I came up right before Facebook, right before everything was popping off. So I learned how to do this in the phone book era, but I wasn't beholden to the phone book era. I really value what I could do now as opposed to then. I mean, if I wanted to connect with a customer in 2010, I had to get a, an actual mailing list and spend all of my budget on sending a letter in the mail to hopefully it say in the letter their individual name. Now, whether it's an email or even just in, I could go on LinkedIn. If I want a catering client, the fact that we could just hit them up direct, film a video directly. Here's another big tip. I say people on LinkedIn are lazy is just so lazy. They have this massive list and they're just going to blanket them. Everyone's trying to do a machine gun approach when the sniper approach always works and they, they're so afraid of it. So we sniper approach it and make a video fully dedicated to the one catering lead that we want. We're like, hey, Hilti, just wanted you to, there's a real video I did where I just crapped on DeWalt drills <laughs> and talked about how great Hilti drills were. And then it led into a video about our catering and then DM'd it to anyone on LinkedIn that was a local Hilti person about using our catering. And then that landed the customer. That statement is an insane statement to 2007, Mike Bausch, that we could do that today. Instead of hoping to finally get the right person and having to call Helen, who calls Tom, who calls Terry, and to fight, to fight, to fight, that we just DM it and send it right to them via video makes this a lot easier to connect. And now the only thing at play here is just how lazy you are or the absence of laziness. 
To continue to play on the selfishness, I know one of the things that you've started doing in terms of like, so obviously, yeah, having a big list is, is a great boon in all of this, right? So for someone who doesn't have that, I think, you know, uh, you've mentioned this idea of, you know, you started using a pop-up form on your website. That was a big boon. Talk us a little bit through that. And what did you offer in exchange for that email address? All it was, was, Hey, put in your email to get updates and a free order of garlic knots stupid simple it's popped up right on the screen which still people will assume it's fascinating people will assume that that's like they have to put in their email to access the website when you can just hit the x at the top of the bubble interesting yeah but people still like okay well here's my email and you just get it and it's like it's my email whatever i don't care but it's not invasive it's not considered invasive anymore and now you're getting to connect with this person directly that's the X factor, the connection or the ticket to entry to connect to now take it further via imaging or via whatever it is. And then that offer, everyone has an offer. And this is not the million dollar offer, the grand slam offer that's talked about so much. It's just, hey, it's free knots and food cost wise in the pizza world. That's my, it has the perceived value of $8, but my food cost on it is negligible. So having an item that costs you next to nothing with high perceived value is the key to a good introductory offer for an email. And any business could do it. The next thing that I advise is saying it in a way that you have not heard before. Most people will immediately go to book your free first, like a gym, your first session free. If they said that same phrase, your, your first sweats time, just come up with some unique verbiage so that my brain doesn't, oh, okay, another free session. Because people have heard it. I had someone hit me up the other day. They said, oh, let's do a, we're your one-stop shop. And I said, do you say the term one-stop shop often <laughs> in life? And they said, no. Like, come up with another way of saying that. And she came up with single source solution. And But that was just, we're the single source solution for this product. And I thought that is so much better than one-stop shop. Because I haven't heard that before. And I think, so one is the non-cliched aspect of it, connection and accessibility. So I know you're big on email. Why was that one of those things that was just obvious to you when you started getting into it? It wasn't obvious to me. It was so cheap that I was like, this can't really work. It was so, like, my thing was, oh, well, because you have that Veblen good mentality that the more money you spend on it, the more you're going to get. And what are the big boys doing? They weren't doing a ton of email yet. They were doing Valpak they were doing penny saver. So that's where my mind was at, but it's what I could afford. And then when I saw it actually working, that's what I started to, to lean into. Okay. Hey, we got to do more of that. That's where it's at. And then when the pop-up happened, I was just a friend of mine. I was like, Hey, I saw these pop-ups. You should do that. And I was like, Oh, I could do that. And I got with my web guy and I did it and constant contact I had the plugin to do the pop-up. And then the autoresponder, and then I did autoresponders, which got me so happy. I was like, oh, I could just save myself explaining because I was trying to like, okay, this quarter, let's send them an email about catering again. Uh, I, they might have seen it, but there's new customers. And the fact that I could do autoresponder and that they would get it and have a drip flow of content. It's an obvious thing now. It wasn't obvious then. And that started to get my mind going with, okay, how could I do more automated connection, which is extreme. Now it's on fire with the amount of automation that people are saying, you know, they have their emails. They People are doing a hundred emails automated and Zapier workflows to automatically have X, Y, and Z happen in funnels. It's a very exciting time, but people are getting too damn good at this and everything's becoming automated. Luckily in the restaurant world, I don't have as much competition in that, but that's where the real secret sauce right now is, is automation and connection. I want to talk a little bit about this relationship between social. So one of the things you had mentioned when we, we spoke last was this idea of if you're doing ads on social, you're doing this type of thing. Like typically when people are seeing those things are not times where they can go buy pizza. Right. And so what you do is actually use those ads. And I think many times people don't understand the value of doing this, but you're using those ads more to get the email sign up so that you can connect with those people at a later time. Talk me through that a little bit. Yeah, because people, if they historically postcards and email, typical email, 10 a.m., typical postcard, they get it at five when they get home, right when they want to eat food. Typical person scrolling 
behaviors are all over the place, very randomized. So the order now is a failure proposition in the food world. If it was a t-shirt, great. If it's food, it's very, very time sensitive. So I need to get them, hey, download this now to get this other thing in the future or give us this now to have this thing in the future and then some type of way for them to believe that they have to do it right now, that there's an opportunity or a limited time opportunity to do it. And that way they get to sign up. Then I can now email them again at the appropriate time. It's even better if I could time it out. Like if they sign up for this, don't immediately send them the freebie, send them the freebie tomorrow at the time when they're likely to use it in connection with the purchase. Oh, I love that. It's exciting because you're, you've gotten into this world where you're like actively thinking about it. Like, I think there are so many things you can kind of like, okay, just do the basics and you're going to be okay. But it's when you start getting excited and really interested in it and start to look at like, where can you get more from it, which is really cool, I think. Well, I wanted to know, you know, what would be your number one tip for a similar business using constant contact then? I think for any business, especially when it's a restaurant, do something different, hit the brain uniquely and don't be cliche. So copy corporate, speak native. So copy corporate would mean use a national email function like constant contact. That's what the big boys use. That's copy corporate. But don't use the same exact look or fonts. Even the fonts could be different. I got an email the other day from Simon Sinek, and he had it in all stark orange. The whole thing was just orange and a very small little quote in the center, which I thought was fantastically different than most emails that people get. The email flow right now is in food is going into photo and copy, which is fine. I'm not going to speak ill of that. It works. But if you could do it in a way where the customer has not seen it done that way, it's going to resonate further. And that's a purely an email. Even just the fact, it's a fact. It's a hilarious fact to me, but it's a fact that if you write an email with an emoji in the subject title, it will get read more. It is annoying to me that that's true, but it is. <laughs> it's so true. I agree with you on that, right? It's so funny that sometimes it's like the stupidest stuff that you're just like, really? Like, that's okay. <laughs> Even more so, I think people would be like, well, then I'll do what Pizza Hut does and I'll put three pizza emojis. I would argue you're better off putting 10 stop sign emojis and that way People know when they subconsciously, when they see 10 stop signs, oh, that's an email for pizza or 10 go sign, like 10 green lights. So it doesn't have the subconscious notion of go stop, but go that that way it's going to now, when they look at this long list of 80 emails that everyone gets in a day, that they're going to see that one stick out already. It's sticking out because it's not using words. It's using emojis and which emojis it's almost like a branded icon built out of emojis if those emojis all do something because of the way that the mind processes data and has, you know, same, 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 different, different. What is it? So I'm curious because, you know, you're learning some things by the process of doing this and testing things out and doing that. And I think oftentimes this is the thing that we often recommend to people like, look, if you don't know where to start, like, yeah, here are the best practices, right? But ultimately, like the goal is to get to a place where you've established your own best practices and the things that work for you, work for your brand and the audience that you're speaking to. Is there anything else maybe similar to like the emoji thing, right? Where you've done something and maybe it surprised you that it worked, but like now that's your new standard. Oh, I mean, there's a lot of food items where I'm like, there's no way that's going to be the thing. And it totally becomes the thing. But to that point, as much as I'm saying stand out before you could play stairway, you should learn to play the basic. Mary had a little lamb. Yeah. And, you know, get an email under your belt, then do A to B testing, do stuff, do stuff. This is the best answer, not the analysis paralysis, but do things. And in terms of email, what I've noticed, again, the U resonates that the things that have shifted, especially in the last four years, where it was, we need to have really interesting content and have a newsletter and have all these, like, again, my first constant contact emails were like newsletter. Here's a photo. Here's the, here's the, the and it was a newsletter. Now I would never do that. It's like photo thing. And it doesn't even need to have a call to action. The Capitol Grill is one of the most successful restaurants in America. It is a straight up photo of a food item and a description of that food item and an order now button. And they send out five a week. And I'm pretty sure they know what they're doing. There is 
a lot of that right now where it's essentially taking Instagram, but using email as the Instagram as just photo and food, photo and food. That's what it is. Get over it. The fact that you could do uh, gifts in email to make them pop more is super great. The use of a dedicated graphic designer, I think, is very well worth the effort and having some good templates built out to do in time. But the real epiphany is don't get married to anything. Be willing to modify and shift on a dime and keep looking at what triggers you, what you read, what emails you resonate with. And that only works if you are the target demo or at least akin to the target demo. If nothing else, then you'll be like, okay, I know how to market to me. What is our 20 year olds resonating with? What are 55 year olds? They all spend money. So what are you looking to connect with the most and whatever venue it is. But again, it all comes back to the email to keep the connection going and to do it at an affordable rate. Best piece of business advice. I gave you the impressive ones, my best, but I'll say, what else do I have? The first chapter of my book is, do you really want to do this? You have to write it down that this is what I want and I'm married to this and I will do this and that conviction. That's the first aspect of it. After that, it's just connection to your employee, connection to your customer, connection to other vendors that you don't pay, and then communication. And everything I say to the customer or to my employee at all points, at all times is always to their benefit. Never, ever, you know, I said that before, it's the selfish example, but what I say to staff, like if someone, an employee, I, I want to get a raise. It's not, well, what have you done? It's, I want you to have a raise too. What do we need to do to get you there? I would assume we need to get this. You have to have this training and this training and do this and have these KPIs. That's to their benefit for the customer. We want to get you to this. We want to give you the greatest experience possible. We want to do this for you. And that leads to a cohesive experience. That's the best business advice I have. I've never fired anyone. I've let people who have already quit via their own actions be promoted to customer. That's really how it boils down. <laughs> Love that. Hey, Mike, what's the name of the book? I wrote the book called Unsliced, How to Stay Whole in the Pizza Industry. Uh, it came out in 2020. It was Amazon number one. It is not your general entrepreneurial look at me book. It's a systematic functional business book geared towards restaurants, but it can apply to anything. It's also on a uh, audio book where you can enjoy six hours of me talking <laughs> and saying the book. I love it. I was very fervent on the book to not be monotone. So many audio books. I'm like, how are you this monotone reading this thing? So it's me with way too much caffeine for six hours straight. <laughs> yeah. I always fall into the I struggle with audiobooks because it's often like somebody reading to you and like just like that whole idea of like somebody reading you to go to sleep when you were little. So I'm always passing out when I try to listen to them. Mike, just as always, it's great to see you catch up with you. I love talking with you. So I appreciate your time here today. Anything else you'd like to add before we uh, we say goodbye? If you've already listened to this far in the podcast, thank you. And, uh, you know, go out there and do what you can. Be authentically you as much as possible. Stand out. If business is a junior high dance, you need to not be a wallflower. You got to be in the center of the floor dancing like a dummy. And if you're doing that, someone might notice and then you could edit from there and progress. Well, friend, let's recap some items from that discussion. Number one. If you're not impressive, by default, you are unimpressive. Remember when Mike mentioned that the worst thing you can be is fine? <laughs> fine means people aren't coming back. They're going to go someplace else instead. And so if you're not working toward making something impressive, your business will never reach the heights you want it to. So where can you set yourself apart? Number two, invest in training your staff. If you truly want to create a business that stands out, you must create an atmosphere where training employees comes first. Mike shared three aspects of training, book, one-to-one, -one, and on-the-job training. By leaning into all three aspects simultaneously, you create something that stands out from the pack. By putting the right systems in place, you can duplicate what works and edit what doesn't. Then real progress starts to happen. And number three, Stop using a machine gun approach when a sniper approach works best. Mike shared the story of making individual videos for the people he was trying to land as catering clients. Instead of using a generic video, he was able to make something that engaged the prospect directly. 
And thanks to tools like LinkedIn, he was able to connect directly with the people that work at the business that he was trying to land. How can you go direct to the source and speak specifically to that prospect? Now, here's your action item for today. Do an experience audit. Whether you're a solopreneur or you have a staff, are you documenting the experience you want to create for your customers on a consistent basis? And are you delivering on those expectations? By putting in the effort to identify those things that are non-negotiable and training people to execute them properly, you'll be setting yourself up to stand out from the crowd. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Be A Marketer podcast. If you have questions or feedback, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me directly at dave.charest at constantcontact.com. If you did enjoy today's episode, please take a moment to leave us a review. Your honest feedback will help other small business marketers like yourself find the show. Well, friend, I hope you enjoyed the rest of your day and continued success to you and your business. Mm-hmm.